Um, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. I'm just kind of amazed at the crowd. I just want to start off with a few, uh, this, actually, uh, we'll quickly introduce ourselves and we'll start off with a few very, very general introductory remarks and then get to the, the reason why you're here, which is to hear about um, the fruits, or to see the fruits of um, uh, the six weeks of work from our Story Plus cohort. So Story Plus belongs to a family of Duke programs that, that um, emphasize team-based, project-based learning. Um, so the, the basic sort of template of Story Plus is that um, undergraduates work in small teams of three to four students um, on a very concrete project conceived by a project sponsor who could be a faculty member, a librarian, um, other ac academic staff, and also a nonprofit organization. Um, and then all, and the students work under the guidance of a, of a graduate mentor who's primarily doctoral students, but also sometimes master students. Um, so that's the structure. So what's the philosophy or what's the substance? Um, Story Plus is a six-week program that immerses students in humanistic research methods and practices with an emphasis on storytelling for public audiences. So what are these methods? Some of them are you know, textual analysis, visual analysis, cultural criticism, archival research, oral history, and also increasingly prevalent practices um, and modes of work like curation um, and digital humanities. And these are modes of engaging with the world that are more vital than ever. Um, I don't need to maybe name all the context. Um, we need more students um, and young citizens with skills to reconstruct complex social realities from prim primary sources and from scholarly literature to discern nuances, complexities, and silences in the archives and also in public discourse to ask questions that have not been asked, we were talking about this earlier today, um, and to communicate these stories and meanings in compelling digital and analog forms to other researchers, to your peers, to younger students even, um, and to wider publics. So, and with that, I'm gonna turn over to Jules to say a quick thing about process. Right, so within that, we have teams that are at different stages in terms of other people, I, I sort of, the students will get tired of me hearing this, it's like a baton handoff. So you're running a relay, and some people, these research projects have been in modes, and so they're picking up where other teams other groups have left off and culminating the sort of the things you're going to hear about are at their way of being finished as if you could ever be finished with research um, or finished with a particular topic or question. Some folks are sort of in the middle where uh, ideas and things are taking a transition from one group to another and the other folks are just at the brand new like just cracking open an archive or maybe one other person has been in it and sort of figuring out sort of what is in there. So I've both talked about how one your process is a product in and of itself, right? It was where another person sort of gets the ideas or the questions that you raise can both be yours if you want to take them for individual research, but also as a team, you're offering your work as the place where other scholars sort of move forward and thinking about that as being a, a really critical, it's hard because when you don't have something like definitive and we're not gonna have an answer, great, we have many, too many quick answers these days, right? We need some more sort of slow baked learning processes. And I wanna thank the students who came to see me and I sort of do a lot of promotion of Story Plus as a research opportunity in the summer and some of you listened and I hope you're happy with the choice. Um, but it's been really nice to be in the process of both talking to the students about it but also seeing their work and seeing their process over the six weeks um, to also think about where they might go from here um, in their own research and also back into team-based projects. And I'll, okay, Amanda? I just have a very quick rundown of the numbers for you before we jump into our uh, presentations. So I think that uh, Chris and Jules covered a lot of the, the structure of the teams, the architecture of the program, and the points and purposes for what we're doing. And I'll give you some numbers. So we had 10 teams, there were 30 undergraduates, 11 graduate mentors, 18 project sponsors, that one Allen building team had a whole <laughs> crew. Uh, they've worked for six weeks with two days of boot camp, four lunch presentations, nine individual consults. That represents 17 different learning sessions over the course of their time with us, taught by 16 different learning instructors, who are all fabulous, by the way. Thank you for those of you who are here. Um, Story Plus Central, core team of three with a great deal of planning help from Liz and Kate. I just saw Kate walk in. And strong graduate mentorship from Maria, like we mentioned. Um, countless hours of hard work from our teams, probably more work than they were supposed to do in some situations, which will be demonstrated by the following nine presentations organized in three clusters of three. I'll jump back in with Instagram numbers when we do the Instagram press. I'll tell you more about that at the end. So now I will uh, let the teams take over. First up, we have Student Action with Farm Workers, right? 
I just want to come up. Hi, everyone. Um, so thank you for all being here. We're really excited to start off today. Um, on behalf of our graduate mentor, Eladio Bobadilla, who was sick and couldn't be here, uh, we are the Student Action with Farm Workers Documentaries team. Um, my name is Ethan Ahuna, and I'm a rising senior at Duke, majoring in sociology with minors in education and Spanish. Hey, y'all. I'm a rising junior here at Duke, and I'm studying global health and and my name is Mary McCall Leland. I'm a rising junior at UNC. Might I say go to you And I'm studying business administration and education policy. Um, and so we had the honor of working with us, this, us playing trivia, um, but we had the honor of working with a great organization called Student Action with Farm Workers. Um, and Student Action with Farm Workers um, was incorporated as a nonprofit in 1992. Um, its office is actually in the Center for Documentary Studies just around the corner here on Duke's campus. Um, and it's a really awesome organization. Um, they work kind of with a twofold mission, one of connecting students with experience in community organizing, social justice and activism, um, and also with advocating for and working with uh, rural migrant farm workers in the Carolinas and the Southeast United States um, to bring them access to more resources and kind of um, empower them as a community. Um, and they also really uniquely use documentary and theater work as an integral part of their outreach, which has been super cool for us as the Story Plus team. Um, they've reached over 100,000 farm workers and families in their tenure as an organization, giving them access to legal, educational, or healthcare resources. Um, they also have involved almost 1,000 students in their work, um, getting them involved and advocating for this population that a lot of people don't know about. Even in doing this project, a lot of my peers at Duke that I talked to had no idea that this population was out in the fields picking the food that we eat every day. Um, and so uh, Joanna Wellborn, who is the communications arts director at SAF, uh, gives access to their really rich archive of 25 years of documentary videos, um, uh, photos, stories, transcripts, all of that, and kind of gave us free reign to um, go through the archive content and make a really um, compelling story celebrating farm workers and SAF as an organization. So now that we have a little more context about why we did what we did this summer, I'm going to talk to you a little more about how we did it. So we created three deliverables, three different documentary films to tell the story of like what Ethan said, who SAF is, the organization that we are representing, uh, who farm workers are, and then just kind of propelling the conversation about how you can get involved or what what surrounds this idea of a farm worker in Eastern North Carolina. And so this process um, was a lot of fun, it was a lot of work. We had to go through quite a bit of process to get to the three documentary film deliverables that we're, um, Zai is gonna talk a little bit more about in a second. And so I would say it's like a four step process, the first of which is storyboarding. So just starting the conversation, what, what kind of story do we wanna tell? What kind of um, ideas do we wanna spark? And how are we gonna do that? And so we just brainstormed for a few days, and then from there, we went into the archives, which is in East Campus. Um, it's in, on West Campus. I'm, don't go here. <laughs> um, it's on West Campus. It's in the Rubenstein Library. And so it's like we have just stacks and stacks of these boxes that are filled with archival objects, like what Ethan said. So like photos, audible stories, uh, meetings, notes newspaper clippings, journal entries. So we like rifled through that um, and just tried to glean out what we could of what could make really um, meaningful content. And that was the second step. Moving to the third step, we went into the fields. As you can see in the short video, we spent an afternoon um, just sort of observing what that reality looks like for a lot of the farm workers to give us a better perspective of who we're serving and, and why. And then from there, we went um, to interviews. So we interviewed staff. We went right over to the other documentary studies building. Um, um, and sat down and this is a picture of us actually interviewing one of the um, employees there and so that was really neat because from those four steps we got our content we got our vision and then we started working and so each of the three of us sort of were the point person for one of the three videos and Zai is going to talk to us a little bit more about what those videos were and how you can watch them yeah so we ended up with three videos that kind of came together after a lot of days of analyzing and looking through material and then coming up with three motifs. Um, the first video we created was We Are. So after looking at a lot of the information, we tend to believe that farm workers are just farm workers. But after looking through a lot of the stories, we learned that farm workers often present themselves with other qualities before farm workers. They're a mother and a farm worker. They're an artist and a farm worker. So we wanted to create a quick video showcasing that. But after we did that, we decided there was a better way to showcase farm worker stories than us speaking for them. 
So we decided to work through a lot of quotes and a lot of information to create a small video of quotes um, and other audio about why farm workers came to the States and why they're doing what they're doing. And then lastly, the video that I was the point person for was interviewing staff employees and showcasing what they've done, the progress and the purpose over the past 25 years, um, which was a really cool opportunity because we got to look through all the material and this was our first time actually getting to interview and put that together. Um, so we're gonna show you one of our first products that kind of started it all. So this is the farm worker We Are video. Um, our first content and we kind of designed the videos in a, a trilogy so you would watch that one um, you would hopefully um, get inspired to learn a little bit, learn a little bit more about farm workers um, go to our next video which features quotes and stories that they have to share for themselves um, and then our third video is kind of what are we doing about it and that features SAP and the work that they've been doing which has been awesome um, some challenges that we came across in creating these stories, um, SAF has a really rich archive of lots of really awesome individual stories of people who are building a house for their families, people who open a taqueria in their town, uh, people who make belts, people who are musicians and write songs, as well as some audio of some of those songs. Um, and so the hard part for us was how are we going to take all these individual stories that are really powerful and kind of make an overarching story um, that kind of gets at the diversity of this population and the diversity of um, the issues and the struggles that they face and why they're so important for us to do something about them um, without making it super long and super boring. Um, thinking about all of the media content that's around us every day, how can we make people care and what kind of media content can we make that will grab people's attention and will keep people's attention? Um, and so that was really hard for us in creating these videos. So this first video was um, tried to like pull at the harshings a little bit and get you kind of in. And then once you're in, we have some other videos that kind of elaborate on those stories. Um, but that was really one of the biggest things that we had to figure out was how are we going to make this both interesting and uh, cohesive and um, complete and covering as much as we can um, without taking away from the individual stories. Um, and so I think we're all pretty proud of the way that it came together in the end. Mm -hmm. And as for, Successes, bottom line, we work very well together. I mean, we got really lucky. As you can see, we had a lot of fun. Um, but we also had great mentors and great support with the Story Plus team. Um, we came into it pretty much believing that we really knew a lot about teamwork and delegating, but I think those skills even got more advanced as we continued. And then as for technical skills, um, me and Ethan walked in not knowing how to use Premiere Pro, and now I think we're Premiere Pros, so. <laughs> And just to wrap it up, I know that we're at almost out of time. I want to throw this back out to you. So the idea of storytelling is to spark a conversation to innovate ideas. And so as you walk away from watching our stories or maybe going on staff and figuring out um, what farm workers are, I want you to think personally about what you know about farm workers, about that population, about that their realities, and then what you can do to be more conscious as a consumer, as an individual, and as a contributor to your society. Thank you. We've enjoyed it. Thank you. Hello, every Ooh, hello everyone. <laughs> we're excited to be here with you all today. I'm Morgan. I'm Nicole. And I'm Mary Helen. And we're Coal in America, along with Professor Free over there with the Duke University's Energy Initiative, Malu and Alex. The goal of the Coal in America project is to explore the history of the coal industry from the perspectives of those who've lived it. 
Over the past six weeks, we've begun the first phase of that project, traveling to Kentucky to interview uh, coal miners, their families, and members of their communities. We've also created a pilot website uh, for archiving and presenting uh, these interviews. As the project expands in the coming years, this website will also expand, expand to include interviews uh, and other relevant resources relevant to every major coal mining region in the US. We've been very careful with how we consider Appalachia, the region that we've been visiting. It's an area that's attracted a lot of scrutiny, from being the ground zero to the war on poverty and to today in the wake of the 2016 election. And to avoid forcing a narrative onto a people already stereotyped as hillbillies, we've let our narrators tell their stories as they see fit, with as much control as they have. So if you take anything away from this presentation, take this. There's no one single story of coal in America. Each person we spoke with shared a very unique set of stories based on their own experiences and their own contexts. And while we certainly noticed common themes throughout narratives, we were really struck by the very broad range of perspectives that these interviews revealed. So we realized that this very short presentation can in no way do justice to the many voices we heard or to the real diversity of people that we've met. But we'd like to very briefly share with you some of the heartbreaking, some of the inspiring, some of the infuriating, some of the funny, and some of the hopeful stories we've had the privilege of hearing. Take a listen. I guess it's just because, you know, I like to work in the mines. I guess when you get it in your blood, you just, that's what you want to do. Yeah. That's the terrifying part of it. You don't know where it's at, what it is, or if you're ever going to see the light of day and that's a bad price to pay just to try to make a dollar funny nicknames too and one of them's name he had a nickname lovely but but uh, and as far as the men you couldn't ask for any better men you know to work with and we had women that worked underground I hadn't been there six months when one of the guys on my section got killed, and I helped carry him to the track. And he died before he got him outside, he said. Said, oh, well, I gotta work. I just can't quit my job now. These stories paint a very complex picture of coal in these regions that, unfortunately, we don't have time to dig into today. What we can do is tell you a little bit of our own story, or at least one day of it. So Wednesday, June 13th, we left our home base in the former coal company town of Lynch, Kentucky at 9 for Malu and Nicole's 10 a.m. interview with Bethel Brock. When Bethel first opened the door, the first thing I noticed was his sweatshirt, which read, Walk the Crooked Roads to Fight Black Lung Disease. We go into his office where we have the interview, where we learn this man entered the mines at 15 years old to support his family, worked in the mines for 27 years, was the union president in Wise, Virginia, before being laid off at 55. By this point, he had already contracted black lung disease. Sadly, black lung disease is something we learned a lot about over the course of this project. Black lung is a uh, progressive and ultimately fatal disease caused by coal dust settling in a miner's lungs over the course of many years. We spoke with 16 miners over the course of this project, many of whom we got in contact with through the Appalachian Citizens Law Center a law firm in Whitesburg, Kentucky, that specializes in assisting retired miners who have black lung. This meant that the, a large number of those we spoke with had the disease. Listen to Bethel, Bethel Brock describe what it's like to live with black lung. See, your legs is the first thing suffers from black lung. See, I can sit on my riding lawnmower or tractor and do okay, but then when I start walking, especially up a hill, it just takes too much oxygen. Eventually, the disease progresses to the point where individuals are bed-bound. If mines are properly ventilated, miners are far, far less likely to get black lung disease. Companies are supposedly held liable if their miners get the disease, and victims of black lung are supposedly entitled to benefits. But the legal battle to get these benefits can take years, and many who suffer from black lung never receive them. Although Bethel had already contracted a disabling illness, he wasn't content to just sit at home. Despite never completing his high school diploma, he went back to school at 55, and at age 60 graduated from the University of Virginia at Wise so that he could become a, a paralegal 
and help fight for other coal miners to get their benefits. It took Bethel Brock himself 14 years to get his benefits from his home company of Westmoreland Coal. After, to hear him tell it, Westmoreland took every legal and some illegal measure to deny him that. We talked about this and a lot more in our 90 minute interview to what it's like to raise seven kids on miners' pay to attempted murder plots in the mines themselves. Still, when I asked Bethel what he wanted people to know about him, he said this. But if, if I had become any kind of a lawyer, I would have been more prouder than I am of my history of coal mining. So after dropping off Molo and Nicole, Mary Helen and I headed over to Jenkins, Kentucky to meet with Mr. Jeff Cornett, or JC. JC is an avid hunter. As we walked into his living room, we found ourselves face to face with what he calls the beast. This right here is the second largest elk known on record to have been hunted in Kentucky. Uh, we sat down in his living room. Morgan took the couch. I took a second recliner, which I pulled closer to his own. That way, the microphone I was holding would have him in range. We sat down, explained the project, and got started. So some important notes about JC, he's in his early 50s, he's the only miner we spoke with who's still working in the mines, and he's one of the few who works or has ever worked above ground on a surface mine rather than below ground in a deep mine. JC is also involved in overseeing the reclamation process for surface mining. So this land right here is an old strip mine that JC helped to reclaim. We talked about a whole bunch of things during our interview, including mine safety and JC's role as superintendent. You're responsible for, first and foremost, the safety of the men. The worst days I've had were actual, actually involved with fatalities, which both were contractors, but, you know, they still don't make it any easier. It's a pretty big responsibility when you have uh, three, four hundred men that uh, depend on you, you've got that responsibility. You know, you've got to keep them safe. And like I say, that's first, first and foremost, it's, it's safety, then productivity. So we want to give you just a hint to some of the stories and thoughts that run through our heads during an interview. When JC discussed uh, making safety the first priority of the mines, I thought of our interview with Mr. Rod Sturgill. Rod Sturgill was a retired miner who survived the 1976 Scotia mine disaster. And I thought of Mr. Freddie Joe Brock, who remembers putting up ventilation equipment underground only when they knew that inspectors were coming. Freddie was not in a unionized mine. However, by this point, we had conducted interviews with 14 other coal miners, which meant that we heard a lot of stories of companies trying to exploit miners and how miners used labor unions to fight back. Which makes me think of Mr. Rex Fields, who was the president of his union at Southeast Coal Company, and of Mr. Larry Eisen, who once went on strike in Harlan County for 13 months in order to get a fair working contract. It was always fascinating to hear the similarities and differences, the connections and contradictions that painted the perspectives of those we uh, spoke with. After Morgan and Mary Helen's interview, JC had an idea. He took all of us to see our first active strip mine, our first chance to see the industry in practice. He took us down roads he had himself built 20 years before and pointed out machinery as we passed it. And after that, he took us to his favorite Mexican restaurant, Jenkins. So after lunch, JC headed off to work and the five of us went to Eola, Kentucky to meet with our artist friend, Jeff Chapman Crane. I'd met Jeff and his good friend, Mike Dixon, the week before at an art festival put on by Apple Shop in Whitesburg, Kentucky. Jeff is an artist and he invited us to dinner, which we had homemade chili and strawberry cobbler, a tour of his gallery where he paints these beautiful portraits of the faces and history of Appalachia. And then we did a round table interview. Right behind him, of course, he's being on the left, Mike on the right, you can see his protest piece about strip mining called The Agony of Gaia that took him 17 years to complete. We sat down with Jeff and Mike in Jeff's gallery, surrounded by the work, uh, and spoke about the lives and perspectives of these two men. Both of them lived in the same communities as the miners we had interviewed, and their lives were also affected by the coal industry, just in different ways. So Mike told us this one story of a coal company threatening to strip his father's land. They were using a legal loophole to begin mining without Mike's or his father's consent. Yeah, that, that happened with, with my family. and. Uh, there was no legal recourse. So I sat on top of a big rock with a shotgun. I knew the guy who was driving the bulldozer. 
And uh, next day I was up there when they started the marked ship and I walked down and said to him, you see the line over there that I marked? He said, yeah. And I said, if you cross it, you die. No one was shot. Um, <laughs> they took the issue to court. Mike was able to defend the land and keep strip mining off his father's property. But uh, it did show this huge array of perspectives that existed in the communities, especially as JC had shown us an active strip job that morning. We so wish we could just play full interviews for you all right now so you could hear the stories of Ed Banks, of Clinton Sanders, of Gary Sloan, of all the other people we had the opportunity to speak with these past weeks. But you'll have to do that on your own time on our beautiful website. You can hear about how JC was almost recruited to go to China to oversee a surface mines. Or the time Mr. Fields went to Washington as union president. Or Mr. Eisen's dream about writing a book about how the best union man he ever met was a woman. We're excited to continue this project in the fall through Bass Connections, to continue learning, and to continue hearing the many, many stories that make up coal and America. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we are remapping the Caribbean, um, a story plus group that's looking at Haitian and Cuban migration to the United States. Um, we were paired with um, Ayana Ligro, and she's a um, graduate student, and Lauren Dubois, our professor. Um, my name is Asha Henderson, and I'm a rising sophomore. My name is Ali Perez, and I'm a rising junior. And I'm San Halim, I'm a rising sophomore. So, just this last week, news that Trump deported over uh, 2,000 children from families at the border dominated headlines. For the past few years, Syrian refugees have been flooding to Europe with governments ill-equipped to help them. And currently a brutal civil war in Cameron has thousands of civilians displaced. So from these kind of news, we can see that the plight of refugees is a real and pressing problem. But this is a problem that has existed throughout history. And more specifically, we're looking at the stories of Cuban and Haitian refugees. We've been doing this through archives. So in our time at Story Plus, we've been looking at uh, the Archives of the National Coalition for Haitian Rights. And this is an organization that from 1982 to 2006, um, they've been fighting for Haitian rights. Uh, yeah, and so uh, we got these archives from a man called, named Jocelyn McCalla, who was the executive director for the NCHR for most of their time, and he recently spoke to us. We believe that archives can inform us equally about the history and about our present. And we're going to do that through three words, uh, perspective, memory, and legacy. OK, so perspective. Um, coming into this project, I had a very American view um, or perspective of both Haiti and Cuba. So everything that I knew was basically from what I learned in history class growing up, and that was a very um, small amount. So we came into this project, um, we kind of began learning the context of both countries. So not only what is going on um, in the present time in Haiti and Cuba, but um, colonial and -colonial, post-colonial um, society. Um, so to start off, uh, we were looking at, um, in the archive, there's a lot of documents and affidavits of Haitian and Cuban refugees who were detained um, in Miami. Um, so first between there, we got to see kind of firsthand how they were treated once coming to this country um, and what they went through. So um, I think here perspective is very important because uh, beginning, I was able to see the refugee perspective and not just um, from a policy standpoint what was going on. Um, so a picture that really stood out to me um, is this one that was taken in the early 90s. Um, this is in front of the White House. Um, and these are all Haitian migrants who have come to this country and are protesting immigration policy that was enacted um, by President Bush Sr. So um, to give you a little bit of background, um, both Haitians and Cubans were fleeing dictatorship regimes um, in the late 90s. Um, Haitians, um, here they are arguing that Haitians are locked out because they're black. So race played a huge role in the differing um, migrations of the two groups, um, and that also um, affected policy that was passed. So that policy that they are 
protesting is um, a policy that bans pre-asylum screening of Haitian migrants who were interdicted or um, ships were seized at sea and um, uh, mandated immediate detention of them once they uh, arrived to the US. So basically, Haitians were looking to be asylum seekers once they came to the country, which means they're given certain rights once coming. Um, however, um, with this policy, they're seen as economic refugees, so they're not given the same rights that Cubans were given at the time. Um, so this led them to be detained, and um, you know, a lot of times they would either be kept there or they would be sent to prisons um, in states like Louisiana or Texas. So here it's really kind of struck me because here I'm seeing um, US um, residents, these Haitians in front of the White House, something you know I visited personally. And this was going on only 20 or 30 years ago. Um, I had no clue prior to this project. And it really shifted my perspective to understand um, more so immigration policy and um, refugees in this country. Yeah, so memory is how we uh, remember things. But uh, oftentimes, our memory can be really spotty. and incomplete. Uh, and that goes for uh, our private memory, but also this thing that, like, our public memory that we have as a country. And so in the history of the US, we leave out many people's stories, especially people we see as kind of other. And these are uh, minorities. These are the poor. These are the immigrants. And in history classes, uh, what I've learned, at least, about Haitian history is limited to it being the first uh, slave revolution. But we forget to include um, our support of Haiti's brutal dictator. We forget to talk about how we occupied Haiti uh, many times. So what does, it like, what does it mean for us to remember Haiti? What does it mean for us to remember its people and organizations like the NCHR that fought for their rights? Uh, why is it important? How can archives help us do this? Uh, through our research in the archive, we've so you can see how organizations like these fought for injustices. We've looked at uh, grant proposals, executive memos, and letters, and pieced together the impact that the NCHR has had on the community. Uh, so the NCHR did things from large-scale operations, like uh, sending letters to the president, like uh, effecting policy, but also from small things like uh, its LEAP program, where they helped improve police-Haitian relations in New York to where they just offered legal help to Haitians. And from this kind of uh, big and small, national, local, we can see how organizations previously fought for people, but also how we can fight for people today. Uh, because when we forget, we fall into kind of the same problems with new nuances. In my blog post that I wrote during this program, I wrote about unaccompanied children that came from Haiti, but were detained in Guantanamo. Uh, so. Right here is a letter that these children sent to uh, President Clinton. And in this letter, they talk about how we're children too. Why don't you care for us? Why do you only let the Cubans in? Why do you let us suffer here? And why do you let us die? And these children, they were detained and they were sent back to Haiti when they had fled their parents being killed. They had fled rape. They had felt fled uh, political persecution. And the US had just sent them there. And this kind of story has a lot of ties to what's happening at the border right now. And so we can see uh, just how the past is reflecting in us. And by remembering this, even though it's unpleasant, we can recognize that this is not just like an isolated uh, injustice. It's not something that's just because of Trump. It's not just by a party, but that it's rooted in something deeper in our country. Yeah, and so in our time here, we can't have, we're one of the first to look at this archive. And as archives are important because they are documents from the past, but they have limitations in that they can't have everything. So I want to know what happened to these children after uh, they were sent back to Haiti or how this organization ended. But uh, yeah, hopefully future researchers will be able to take that. What we've done is try to create um, something to remember these organizations by.
Finally, this all culminated in us understanding the U.S.'s legacy of immigration policy, as well as the legacy of the NCHR, the National Coalition for Haitian Rights. And so um, a lot of what Asha and Sanha talked about was the detention of um, immigrants. And that's not really something I could have predicted that we would spend much of our time going into. And that's crazy for me to have that sort of ignorance, especially because we're hearing a lot about the detention of immigrants that are coming to the US today. And so I think um, all of that kind of process led me to um, this magazine or newspaper that you see here. We spent a ton of time understanding um, Haitian and Cuban detention in Guantanamo. Um, Haitians began being detained in Guantanamo in 1991, and um, Cubans were detained in Guantanamo starting in 1994. Both groups were detained there until 1996, and throughout this period, there's gross injustices um, enacted on both populations, but there's also an impressively um, unequal um, kind of conditions between both groups. Cubans had a ton of advocacy um, with their population in Miami that was fighting for them, and Haitians did not share that similar um, support. And because of this, I started looking at Exodo. It was a magazine produced by Cuban refugees in Guantanamo. It was completely designed by them, all this artwork, Every single copy was handwritten. They're approximately 20 pages long, and they're um, really they're huge because they were posted in um, camp centers. And so um, every week they would come out with a new edition. They had articles. Sometimes they talked about rights, and they helped the refugees understand the Universal Declaration of Rights. Um, but they also had a bunch of cartoons and comics and everything. And that led me to as you can see here, two um, horoscopes. And through this, I started researching horoscopes because I was like, why would they include horoscopes? It doesn't seem like a very significant thing to include in a newspaper, especially when you're a refugee who's like fighting for your life. Um, but the horoscopes were great. They were an amazing representation of Cuban creativity um, and ingenuity. They acted as a sort of self-policing system, and they kind of gave other refugees advice and hope, essentially. Um, they would tell them things like, remember to bathe, remember to act respectful. And it was sort of a way that I think the Cuban population was fighting for itself and fighting to be heard and fighting to be understood. And they knew that if they wanted to be respected, they had to um, maintain a, a good um, personality. So our goal throughout all of this was to leave a legacy for the NCHR. And so we did this in three distinct ways. Each of us wrote a blog post on a different aspect of the archive, as well as we created a timeline for the, the NCHR, which outlined its activities. And finally, everything culminated into us creating a Wikipedia page for the NCHR. Um, <laughs> we did this because no information exists on the NCHR online except from the collection guide that Duke offers. Um, and so we figured a great way to be accessible and to um, really create the NCHR's mark on the world was, to, was through a Wikipedia page. And um, while it's not up yet, it's going through the review process, it will hopefully be up in about three weeks. And um, it was a great way for us to kind of start the research and kind of leave it open for future questions because we didn't have time to answer all the questions that we had. But um, we hope that this is a great starting point for someone else and really just encourages um, a uh, more populations to understand the NCHR, understand Haitian and Cuban migration, and to continue the conversation about immigration policy in the United States. Thank you. I don't know. Where else. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, y'all. But um, here's the timeline. Um, so it starts um, in 1950 with the rise of um, the Duvalier regime, who was a dictator in Haiti at the time. Um, it kind of goes through um, Castro in Cuba, migration, uh, migration, um, the radio, which was really popular in Haiti to get out word of what was going on. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of what we did. 
I think that um, to end, we would just like to thank um, everybody who worked on Story Plus, um, as in you know, Amanda, Christina, Jules, um, and then also to our grad mentor and professor. Um, you know, my group kind of called me dramatic for this, but I kind of described this project as life changing in a way because it really shifted how I think of things and how I see the world and kind of also what I might want to do um, in the future. So I want to say thank you and that it's been a great experience. So if, if you'll stay up here for a moment, and if the other teams will join, we're going to have a little Q&A. So if anyone has a question for any of our teams, we will open the floor for that. OK, so this is for the farm team. Um, because when I, when I thought about farmers in North Carolina, I, didn't, I saw like primarily what I would consider Mexican. Um, I'm not sure if that's true or not. And in doing the work, did you find that that community was afraid of being undocumented? Or is the reality that they've been in America, but they're still looked upon as undocumented? Because in our minds, we don't think about how Mexicans have been here for generations, um, but we always look at them as undocumented. Yeah, so just to make sure I'm, we're on the same page, you're asking if they are afraid to be perceived as undocumented? Were they primarily were they pri Mexican? Okay. And if they were, did you find many undocumented okay. farmers that were afraid to, Got to talk to you? Yes. Or is the narrative that they have been here in the country legally but are still looked upon as undocumented because of prejudice? Okay, so to answer her question, uh, to start, there is a law called H-2A, which protects farm workers and brings them from Central and Latin America. And so majority of, of workers are under the H-2A. Is that? Yeah, um, I believe um, the stat from the staff website is like about half of the workers are undocumented and then another good portion of them are on H-2A. Um, we only got to go to one camp. Our primary role was to um, be in the archives, but the one camp that we went to, they all happened to be from Mexico and they all were H-2A workers. Um, there are people from other countries and there are like women in the fields and part of our struggle was how do we um, capture that as well and not make people think it's just um, Mexican immigrants, but the majority of the people that we talked to or that we read about were had come from Mexico. Um, and we didn't have the chance to meet any um, undocumented workers, but there are stories about um, in the archives about undocumented workers, and they often are afraid to drive or to go into town because of those reasons. Is that? Thank you. Is there a question for one of the other of our teams? Yeah, um, so my question is for the um, oral histories in Appalachia group. Um, I was wondering, um, especially like in that aftermath of the 2016 election, a lot has been made um, about uh, blue collar America and how um, it's like political, the po it's political, political basis somehow shifted to the right from being um, one solidly Democrat to Republican. I was wondering, um, did some of your oral histories kind of reflect that shift or was it more focused on the actual, their lives rather than kind of their political views? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we didn't ask people about their political views, but it definitely came up sometimes. And what we found was that there's the whole spectrum. You know, we had people who had pictures of Obama in their living room, multiple people who had that. So um, yeah, I think really what we found was that everyone has, you know, their own experience, their own perspective, and there's just such a range with all of these people you talk to. I would also like to add, yeah, we did have people at Obama. We had people who definitely did not have That's Obama. True. And we had a lot of, we definitely didn't ask those questions because a lot of people like to ascribe a narrative. And like we said, we're trying to avoid that. But it, when it did come up, it always came up in very interesting scenarios where very casually, there's a whole policy like in the, in the South where you don't bring up politics at the dinner table and most people usually followed that. But some people, some of these guys, when you're fighting for your black lung benefits, you're, you're usually pretty savvy about it. So some of them have actually talked to reporters. And one story that Mr. McCool taught me or told me about his first interview with someone that they were definitely trying to feel him out for that. And he thanked us for not doing that because he, he was, um, 
politically towards the right. And he, he thought that all that he told them, that his whole life story being reduced to where he voted, he, he felt the kind of offended towards that. So that's something we tried to avoid. And do we have a question for the remapping team? The team that just went? Claire, thank you. Can you pass it down to Claire, please? I'd be, <laughs> I'd be very interested to hear more um, from you about how the experience of studying um, migrants and immigrants changed your perspective and your plans for the future. Okay, that's a great question because I've done a lot of reflecting um, the past <laughs> few weeks. Um, so I kind of came in um, thinking, so I am a pre-medicine student, so I was thinking kind of, you know, maybe I'll look at this in the health perspective. Um, there was a lot about um, stigmatization of um, Haitians coming to the U.S. and having um, AIDS or bringing HIV to the country. Um, however, I kind of was more captivated by policy, um, strangely enough, um, because a lot of what the U.S. passed immigration-wise um, very, very much so affected how different um, people in power in Haiti and Cuba would act. Um, so when President Carter was in office, he was very much so about human rights. So they weren't doing as many um, vi uh, violent tactics at that time. And then whenever um, President Reagan got into office, it kind of went, yeah, you know, from there uh, a little bit worse. Um, so. That is what really captivated me, and so because of that, um, because you know this whole region of the country, the Caribbean, so interesting to me, um, I'm thinking about maybe a major shift. So looking um, at uh, international comparative studies, I was sociology major, but I think the main thing for me is that um, I've always had a very, very strict American perspective, and I cannot um, emphasize that enough. Um, I grew up in Louisiana, so patriotism, nationalism, you know, it's like in my blood. But, you know, I have to remember that the U.S. is one country of many. So um, by being able to kind of look through the lens of Haitian or a Cuban um, or anybody who's not a native to this country, you realize that there's a lot more important um, than just how we see things. So I think that's best how I would encapsulate the transition in me. Yeah. All right, and we have one more. Um. Okay, thank you. All three projects are just amazing, and I'm just I'm really blown away. And actually, it's probably the only bright spot of this entire horrible week. Um, but um, I so with that said, I actually did have more of a kind of maybe process question because two out of the three groups, and in some ways, if you want to think of Appalachia as its own dialect too, um, you're working with people who primarily speak different languages. And I was really curious um, how many of you came in with a little bit of expertise? Or if you didn't, how did you kind of navigate that? And how did you think about what the role of language learning is to your storytelling projects? Uh, I mean, I can take one. OK, all I'll say is that most of our, um, a lot of our the movies we watched and some of the documents were in Creole, um, Haitian Creole, and also in French, um, so and then Spanish. So OK. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so as far as Haitian Creole, luckily our grad mentor um, is Haitian, and so she kind of guided us through Haitian Creole, kind of um, was like a crash course, like let us read it, and we were all horrible at it. Um, but the newspapers that I got to look at were in Spanish, and so to answer your question, um, I'm a Spanish speaker, so that was totally luck on my part, um, but I did heavily use Google Translate, because sometimes you just you don't know. Um, and then some of our documents were also in French, so we kind of got the whole thing. And I was taking French at Duke, which is another kind of, it just sort of happened. And I'm not good at French. I'm barely good at Spanish. So it was kind of just a learning process. Um, but the, lang the different languages definitely gave you different perspectives. And so that was really interesting to see. Yeah, and really quick, um, we were all relevantly proficient in Spanish, are relevantly proficient in Spanish. Um, we're very lucky in that the archives, um, a lot of them have been translated. Um, SAF does a really, really great job of making everything bilingual and accessible to both languages. Um, and so a lot of the content that we were using was already translated, or they have a translator. So when I had some quotes in Spanish that I wanted to make sure I was like correctly translating the meaning and the emotion behind them. Um, we sent those to the translator. Um, so that was really, we ended up not needing too much of our Spanish because the archive was so bilingual already. 
And Appalachia does have a dialect kind of to itself. Um, we were kind of lucky in that I'm from Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, Nicole is from Charleston, South Carolina. And so the two of us, we did a little bit of code switching because we both have Southern accents that if we are around other Southerners, it will come out. And we were just kind of used to that. Um, and so it was kind of funny, Morgan would like hear us talk where we'd start our day with our typical speaking accents. And by the end of it, I couldn't, I couldn't stop speaking in a Southern accent. So Morgan, she's from San Francisco. She had a little bit more of a learning curve. <laughs> Everyone thought that was so cool yeah, that she was it. from San Francisco. They loved the fact that she was from so far away and that she was interested. So um, we, we were also lucky that um, our mentor, uh, Jonathan Free, he was actually from Kentucky. Um, he was from the more flatland part, not the mountainous part uh, of Kentucky, but his wife was from the mountains. And so he was also familiar with the culture in the area. So we and lucked usually, out. Usually you have a lot of people going into Appalachia and trying to go there for their own purposes or taking pictures for their own purposes. So there was that kind of barrier that we had to cross, but being respectful usually, I mean, people were usually pretty receptive and very generous. They welcomed us into their homes and showed them all who they were. And like some people say that you're giving a voice to people when you're doing these sort of things. But that's definitely not what they're doing. You're going into their homes and they're welcoming you and they're teaching you because you have something you can learn. And we hope that we can share that with you, the understanding that we've gained because of their generosity. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for being here with us today. As you can see, we are the stone by stone who built the chapel group. And that's the question that guided us at the beginning, but it did change throughout the process, as you'll hear more about later on. Um, so to start us off, I'm just going to give a like, brief overview of Duke Construction. Um, it really, Duke University existed under different names in different places for a few decades, but it really started in 1924 with the creation of the Duke Endowment by tobacco tycoon James B. Duke. Um, that was a $40 million trust fund, $19 million of that was specifically for construction and buying land for the new Duke University. West Campus in the chapel, as you might know, was designed by Julian Abel of the Horace Trumbauer architecture firm. Um, he was the first African-American graduate of the University of Pennsylvania's architecture school, and he was responsible for the vast majority of the work in designing West Campus and the chapel. Um, so in 1925, J.B. Duke passed away, and he left an additional $67 million, and that's really when construction really got going, um, as you can imagine. <laughs> Um, so East Campus was built from 1925 to 27, West Campus from 27 to 30, and then the chapel from 1930 to 1932. Um, in addition to this overview of Duke history, it's also important to place it in the context of American history. So we often think of the Great Depression as starting after the stock market crash in 1929, but in parts of the rural South, um, it really set in much earlier. By the, by the mid-1920s, large parts of the South were already hurting, um, and North Carolina was definitely part of that. In addition to that, this is also firmly within the era of Jim Crow, and that's something that we see very much just within us, like what we've seen as researchers. There's a big disparity between information available about white workers versus about black workers. Census records and everything are very skewed. Additionally, the data we've pulled from those records, um, on average, black construction workers at Duke were paid 14 cents less by the hour than white construction workers. That doesn't sound like a lot, but adjusted for inflation, that's about $2 an hour less. Um, so that was just something that we need to keep in mind as we're progressing through this. So we're just going to walk us through um, some of the spotlights of what we've researched uh, over the course of the summer and kind of try to show that we've done a lot of different things throughout the summer. So. Right, and this is the South in the late 20s and early 30s, and so that's going to materialize in a number of different ways. Um, first of all, we're going to see a lot of uh, transients with these workers. There, We look through ledgers, and so a name will pop up for one week and then be completely gone the next week. Maybe he'll just work 17 hours and then disappear. Um, we can also see there's no safety regulations um, in this state. We're working on roofs up here, and there's no harnesses, there's no, like, uh, there's no hard hats. They just have fedoras on. That's what they're... <laughs> um, it's uh, completely unsafe. And because of that, we saw two deaths during the construction of West Campus uh, and during the chapel. So one was a foreman and the other one was a bricklayer. And um, we're also going to see like 60, 70 hour work weeks. We're going to see a worker, uh, one worker in particular worked three days in a row, 17 hours a day, and then he would work two more days for 12 hours a day. Um, 
We're also going to see that black workers bore the brunt of this economic turbulence. They're making 68 cents on the dollar to their white counterparts while working three more hours a week on average. So another uh, aspect of our research was interviewing descendants of chapel workers, uh, one of whom was named Joe Cohn, a 76-year-old man still living today in Durham. His father was Elijah Alexander Cohn, better known as Shorty. Um, Shorty was from Faith, North Carolina, right outside of Salisbury, and he did stone cutting work all across the South from construction project to construction project until he ended up here in Durham uh, to work on the chapel. He specifically designed uh, the arches, or specifically worked on the arches uh, immediately, to the, immediately to the left of the chapel entrance, according to Joe. Um, after the chapel was finished, however, he stayed in Durham and stayed in his mill house right off of East Campus, continuing to raise his family and work on construction projects for Duke's campus. Um, unfortunately, he contracted tuberculosis and was sent to a tuberculosis uh, sanatorium in Durham, where, get this, they removed half of his ribs um, in a surgery. We're not kidding, half of his ribs. Um, and what's even more bonkers is that after they removed his ribs, he kept working, as Joe told us. Um, so pretty incredible. But um, what we also really loved about doing these interviews is we got to learn a lot about the interviewees themselves, um, especially Joe, who we like to call the Forrest Gump of Durham because he's been here, he's lived here his whole life, he's seen it all, he's done it all. Um, he sold peanuts at Duke football games. He was part of the first racially integrated high school classes here. Um, he worked at Liggett and, Liggett and Myers Tobacco Company for environmental protection, and he raised his family here and still lives here to this day. He even feeds deer from his backyard with loaves of bread, which is incredible. Um, and he really, to us, Joe really embodies uh, what the chapel construction means to people outside of Duke students who get to admire it every day. Another thing that we investigated in part of our research was we got a tip from someone that said that stonemasons came from the town of Valdez, North Carolina, which is just in the foothills of the mountains. And that seemed pretty remarkable to me. So I reached out to the director of the town's heritage museum, and there were two dozen stonemasons who came from Valdez to Durham to build the chapel. Um, this becomes even more remarkable when I learned a little bit more about the history of their town. Um, the history of Valdez, and they're called the Waldensians that live there, begins in the Italian Alps and 1190 when um, a group of people started worshiping and believing differently than the Catholic Church allowed and they were brutally persecuted for several centuries afterwards. There's stories that um, soldiers one time came upon them worshiping in a cave in secret in the woods and they set the cave on fire and when the worshipers ran out they killed them off one by one. Um, and so there's dozens of stories of like that, just centuries of persecution. Um, in the mid 1800s, the Waldensians got religious freedom uh, and some of them decided to start anew in a new part of the world and set up a community in Burke County, North Carolina, um, which is just such a crazy connection. And the hay life there at the beginning days, um, they set up the, the town was founded in 1893 and at the beginning, it was a very hard life and work was very scarce there. So many men, uh, only men, sorry, um, <laughs> traveled around throughout North Carolina and beyond as far as Arlington National Cemetery in Virginia and other places uh, doing work with stonemasonry skills that they had learned at home. One of those places was the Duke Chapel here. Um, so that was something that was just so fascinating to learn throughout our research. Yeah. So now we're going to talk, oh, whoops. <laughs> so now we're going to talk some about, um, oh, there's the, Hammers. These are stone tools that might have been used to build the Duke Chapel, so, yeah. So we're gonna talk some about our process. Um, as Gretchen alluded, we came in with the mindset of chapel workers are bust. So we're coming into the university archives and Rubenstein Library, we're looking for names of chapel workers, we're looking for their stories, and we come across these ledgers, which are from 1927 to 1930, which is when West Campus was being constructed. The chapel was from 1930 to 1932. Um, and as a result, we had to expand the scope of our project. We wanted to, decided to include these workers in as well as, um, you know, the workers we found through interviews and through news articles and such. Um, working with these ledgers was both incredibly fruitful and challenging. As you can see, 
It's written in cursive, handwritten. The handwriting would change throughout the years. Names would be spelled differently week to week. Um, sometimes occupation wouldn't be listed. Um, but we transcribed all these ledgers. We took out average wages, average hours. We looked up these names on Ancestry.com to find out more demographic information about them. And we even were able to craft a couple of our spotlight features based on these ledgers. And of course, uh, this process is not perfect and our methodology does, co does come with holes. And so because we're looking through Ancestry, which pulls from census data and city directories and death certificates, um, and because we're looking at these ledgers and we, decide, we couldn't look up all of these workers, there were over 400, um, we found about half of them and we prioritized the ones that appeared on the ledgers more often. So compounded, compounded, this means that the less transient worker is the worker that we're going to find more information on. And it's very possible that uh, black workers are um, underrepresented in our information and in our tables and they're definitely under, underrepresented in our spotlight features because like just looking through the photos that we have, the number of black faces that we see does not match up to the number of black stories that we have and the interviews that have been transcribed over the years by reporters on stonemasons and on uh, the laborers on the chapel. So that's just something that we wanted to note and point out and keep conscientious when we're br browsing through our website, which has collected all of these stories and which has pinpointed and located these holes. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. I think we're gonna start with a quick introduction of ourselves. My name is Ellen Song and I recently um, completed my doctorate in English here at Duke. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I'm Alan, I'm majoring in history. I'm Lexi. Well. I, <laughs> I'm also a history major with minors in psychology and Spanish. I'm Zara, rising sophomore, don't know my major yet. <laughs> So I'm just gonna speak for um, one minute about uh, who we are and what our goals for the summer were. Um, we are the Allen Building Takeover at 50 team, working on the 50th commemoration of the Allen Building Takeover. So we are planning an exhibit that will go up in February of the following year. We hope all of you will go see it um, right on the first floor of Perkins Library. Um, just, just to give a little bit of brief historical context, Duke University desegregated its uh, undergraduate class officially in 1963, but black students continued to face um, unique challenges and alienation on a predominantly white, white campus. Six years later, on February 13th, 1969, over 50 black students, members of the Afro-American Society here at Duke, occupied the Allen Building with a list of demands, including um, probably most prominently the creation of an African-American studies department. What our team did was to curate an exhibit, both physically and digitally, that will focus on the day of the actual event. So um, uh, starting with the morning of February 13th all the way through the evening. Um, and they were really, um, they were really intent on showing the Allen Building takeover through the perspectives of the students that were actually involved in the building. Um, rather than um, through the perspective of the administration, which is usually how the Allen Building Takeover is studied. So without further ado. Um, so one of the two products that we um, had created by the end of the six week program was the layout for a physical exhibit. On this slide behind me, you'll see, uh, this is called a SketchUp. It's a program that, um, the Rubenstein exhibits team uses to imagine the exhibits before um, we can see them in reality because currently there's another exhibit for the gardens in the space that we will be using next February. Um, so this is kind of what our product next February will look like. A bit of our process is that we started in the archives going through um, many different collections that contain materials um, about the Allen Building takeover and some of the events before and after. And from there, we compiled a list of items that we thought we might use in our exhibit. And then we came back together as a team to discuss what sections and what themes we wanted to highlight. And from there, we sort of moved into creating sections and labels um, that would correspond to each case that you can see um, in this um, 
SketchUp. Um, just to give you a little bit, walk you through this virtual exhibit, um, if you look to your far left, there um, is a black screen. That is a slideshow that will contain quotes from um, black students who were at Duke during the process of desegregation to sort of give um, visitors to our exhibit a sense of what was it like at Duke in the 60s. And moving um, from left to right, you'll see in the middle of that white wall is our introductory text that sort of is our statement of purpose for the exhibit. And then moving further along is a timeline of the events of the day and that wall ends with a slideshow that contains um, eyewitness accounts, um, quotes, and images from the confrontation between police and student protesters that resulted in the police tear, um, spraying tear gas onto the crowd. Um, one of the challenges that we had to work with is that um, during the school year, we are all taught to think critically and analytically in the essays that we write and in the projects that we pursue. Um, from this, for our group, for the first time, this is we had to think um, not only visually but also spatially. We we're creating a three-dimensional display, and that required us to consider how do um, people interact with text, um, video, pictures, audio, but also space. And so, as Lexi briefly talked about, one of example of one of our sections is the police and protest section. And so, the morning, the members of the Afro American Society took over the Allen Building. That afternoon, President Knight called the police to help remove them from the building. And this caused a clash. That after the members of the Afro American Society had left the building, the police entered the building and came out of the building to find a thousand supporters that were Duke students and community members there to support the Afro American. American students. And so what culminated was a clash between the police and the supporters. And so in this image here that's titled Never Again at Duke, it's a police officer standing with a gas mask and baton in hand over a supporter. And it's paired with the caption Never Again at Duke. This visually stunning image shows you just a glimpse of what the chaos that occurred that night. And along with this in the exhibit, uh, there will be a gas mask and a baton in a case with this poster blown up. Yeah, so um, to complement our actual physical exhibit, which goes up in February, um, we also created an online exhibit through Omeka, which is the library's um, digital template they use for um, all the online components for their exhibits. So this is how it looks like. Um, yeah, um, it follows pretty much the same format as um, the physical exhibit will in February, um, it goes in chronological order, describing the context um, and the events of that, that day through um, old Chronicle articles, photographs, and archival documents. And um, each of us were assigned different parts to complete. And so one of uh, my sections was alumni white lash. And yeah, so before uh, the age of Facebook and Twitter, um, Duke alumni wrote to the president to kind of express their opinions on certain events. And even though today we tend to memor memorialize the Allen Building takeover as being positive, otherwise we wouldn't be doing this exhibit, um, it was incredibly controversial um, at the time. And these letters really express the indignation, the anger many um, alumni, um, many of them white males, um, expressed at on black students taking over the main administrative building on campus, like Edward J. Burns, class of 1929, who wrote to President Knight, Duke University is a private institution and should limit its students to the best young men and women dedicated to obtaining a good education and promoting the best interests of Duke, our state and nation. I do, not think that the, I do not think that the vast majority of Negroes qualify for attending Duke in any respect. They are the principal cause of the disturbances that have taken place on the campus, and it would be better that they would be excluded from the student body entirely for many years to come. Duke was a much better institution in a number of ways before they were admitted. So clearly, he would have a heart attack if he looked at Duke today. And so we wrote curator's notes for the exhibit, Alexi, Allen, and I, which will be displayed in the exhibit. And I'm just going to read you a few lines from um, our notes. Um, 
The, although the takeover is now preserved in the archives, its impact has lasted long beyond the events of February 13, 1969. The radical actions of Duke's black students in the late 60s set the standard for students navigating campus life in the present. Their brave actions helped to inspire future minority students to voice their concerns on a predominantly white college campus. They set a precedent for future student activists to stand up to the administration and to demand a better vision for their university. They ensured that their, their voices were woven into Duke history. Most importantly, they paved the way for students of all colors and backgrounds to create a space of their own on this campus. Ultimately, on February 13, 1969, black students demanded that Duke be more than a school, more than an institution, asserting all students' rights to a family, community, and home. Um, so, um, as we wrap up our presentation, we wanted to thank our project sponsors, which include, um, if you guys could raise your hand, there's some of them in the audience, I'd appreciate that, because they're in the um, middle row, but uh, they were instrumental in helping us achieve the amount of work that we did. It was a lot of work and a lot of effort to create an exhibit, and it would not have been possible without their help. Um, to wrap up, I'd just like to read a quote um, that was included in um, a retrospective published by the university in 1993 that was commemorating um, black students at Duke. And this is a quote from ben Brenda Armstrong. She is currently um, um, part of the Duke Medical School and serves as the Dean of Diversity. But back in 1969, she was actually one of the student black students who participated in the takeover. So in choosing to confront Duke, we students had carved a place in history for ourselves. Our enduring legacy would be one of leadership, commitment, extraordinary academic and professional productivity. Indeed, such achievement through struggle and the ensuing myths created would be the stuff of legends. And on our shoulders would stand generations of black students to complete their unfinished business at Duke. Thank you. Hi everyone, we're the Story Plus Preaching and Protest team. I am the grad mentor piece. I'm a doctoral student in homiletics at the Div School. And I wanted to introduce our team before uh, we showcase the multimedia presentation that we provided for you. You should also be getting a program guide that we sent out. It has the link to the Duke Chapel repository where you can access the sermons and the manuscripts and the audio, um, as well as um, um, information so you can um, also, yeah, contact info if you wanted to access the other sort of deliverables that we've created. Um, in our team, we have the sensational Sonia, who's a recent MDiv grad from Duke Divinity. And then we have Naomi, who is a AAAS major with a minor in gender, sexuality, and feminist studies and a documentary certificate, study certificate, but she's the one who created the audiovisual, so uh, we want you to keep that in mind. This beautiful multimedia was done by her. We have Brennan Neely, um, an English and philosophy major, and who is also a brilliant poet and who will be sharing his spoken word with us. That's gonna be interspersed with our presentation. Finally, we have Liddy Grantland, a Duke Chapel scholar, a English and AAAS studies major, <laughs> um, and who um, will also share some of her beautiful prose. So let's get started. Over the course of this summer, our team has analyzed a total of 92 sermons preached between February 1960 and July 1964 at Duke Chapel. Our focus was on the civil rights movement, happenings of the time. Did preachers reference the events of the day? If they did, did they do so explicitly or in more subtle and veiled ways? If they did not, what did they talk about instead of the civil rights movement? We pulled out key quotes and key words. We outlined the sermon's moves and arguments. We looked at what was happening in the world and in Durham at the time, noting whether the sermon touched on current events or neglected to mention them. 20 of the 92 sermons came with no manuscripts, so our team had to manually generate trans transcripts for them. Transcribing was our biggest challenge because we typed every word out by hand. Between adjusting to the speed of the sermons, constantly going back to change typos, and then analyzing each transcript down to their focus and function, we were tired. <laughs> we remember holding our hands up to crack them, crack them, and the pain shooting through each of our fingers. 
We might all be suffering from carpal tunnel, and FHI will soon be receiving bills from Duke Hospital Orthopedics. <laughs> We truly cannot know what actually happened in the preaching moments during those years because we only had access to about half of the sermons from that time. And even these records of manuscripts may not have been what preachers said off the cuff at the pulpit. But what we do have on record are just a handful of instances in which a few preachers spoke out in explicit or implicit support of the civil rights movement. The scene is Nashville. The time, the year of our Lord, 1960. The season of Lent. Eighty or more Negro youth take their seats at the segregated lunch counters of three dime stores. In the 1960s, what people believed and what they preached were both fluid and definite. People dodged and shifted with each event and pressure. Their opinion changed, some of them because they had to change. The strength of declaring an op opinion always balances testily with the shame of its afterlife. We criticize our fellow humans and preachers when they do not change because we see what separates the street and the house of God. Stained glass depictions of iconic biblical scenes, moral examples for both the church and the street to see. We know stains for what they are, things to be seen, washed, then remade. Irritating mistakes sometimes, sometimes necessary ones, sometimes intentionally made in jest and joy, and always consequences of action and action. His gallows is even in the dime store, isn't it, on the cheap jewelry counter? Quite close to the lunch counter where Negroes are not allowed to sit. What does he think of us whose pride is so stubborn that if we cannot build it anywhere else, we build it on pigmentation of the skin? What does he think of us? Oh, prejudice. How much prejudice there is today, national, racial, religious, social prejudice. And every one of us is constructed in such a fashion that he holds on with greater tenacity to his prejudice than he does to his conviction. Simple, our story. Rebuke these protesters, the stuck up asked of Jesus. I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Yes, our story is simple. Prophets, protesters, people were rebuked. The meek, they still suffer. We cry out, before we were silent, in your hands as you broke the meek, silent still when we were put in your crowns and chapels. And now you are tranquil, happy, warding away the days when the bread in your hands will turn to stone against your neighbor. So we cry, don't you see? Chants of tranquility and happiness, the bread feeding these chants, fall like stones on the weary and suffering for whom these are the worst of times, an ageless winter of despair. The mission of the Mega Evers House is to uh, make people aware of who Mega Evers was, his works, and the sacrifices that Mega Evers and his family made. had been in his office all day and in the evening he watched John Kennedy's civil rights speech. Uh, left there and went to a mass meeting downtown Jackson at New Jerusalem Baptist Church and um, from there he came. The purpose of incorporating this clip is not necessarily to highlight Medgar Evans but rather to highlight an important event that happened within civil rights and also highlight how such event was not discussed the following Sunday for that sermon. There were many other events 
but this is just an example of how civil rights was not incorporated into the narrative of chapel sermons. Miles away from Duke Chapel on Father's Day, a father was being mourned by his three children. A choir singer, a veteran, a knower of the law, a dad, a dad, a dad, whose three children had rushed to the door and yelled to their mother that their father was home four days before Father's Day. A dad, a dad, a dad, whose life was ripped from him in his driveway, a driveway that had been bombed less than a month earlier. A dad, a dad, a dad, who, when he was shot, got up with a bullet wound in his chest and walked 30 more feet, trying just to reach his front door. A dad, a dad, a dad, who died because someone killed him in his driveway four days before Father's Day. And what remains 55 years later is a sermon transcript from Howard Wilkinson, who preached in Duke Chapel four days after Medgar's murder, that included no mention of the three fatherless children in Jackson, Mississippi that Father's Day. In our time, men of integrity on both sides of the civil rights controversy are aware of inner torment. The accepted attitudes and traditions of an earlier era will not change easily. The convictions of my own grandfather, who wore the gray uniform in the War of 100 years ago, a man of conscience, make my own intellectual transformation extremely troublesome. We studied many sermons preached at Duke Chapel between 1960 and 1964. Some preachers spoke up against prejudice and racism, while many were silent in the name of civility. Dr. King wrote in his letter from the Birmingham jail criticizing white clergymen for their complacent silence in the face of pervasive violence and hatred. As another great preacher, Desmond Tutu, once said, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. And that was true in, 19, in the 1960s, as it is true in 2018, as residents of Flint, Michigan, still don't have clean water. When there are still no electricity in much of the island of Puerto Rico, when, in some, when Islamophobia and discrimination issues Fourth, even from our Supreme Court, when violence against black and brown bodies go unpunished, when undocumented babies are ripped away from the loving arms of their parents. I tell you, if, if these, these were silent, the, the very stones, stones would cry out. Thank you. The other teams will also come back up. We'll have a few questions, maybe one for each team again. I really like the way you use the Medgar Edwards incident to kind of portray, in a sense, the dog that didn't bark, if you know what I mean. So in other words, you took this, this resounding sort of gunshot in the night moment and noted the, the silence that followed in these events. And I, and I think what would be very interesting is the question of you know, did you look at, um, in that period, some of the other um, singular moments and find repeated moments of silence? You know, after the Freedom Ride violence, after, um, after Birmingham, mm -hmm. after Birmingham, you know, murdered little girls. So, you know, did you see these moments of dogs not barking throughout these sermons? We, I think we all did, and um, I had a day where I, did that sermon, The Paternity of God, which talked about God's love for all people like a father, um, but didn't have any mention of Meg Grabbers, which doesn't mean that he didn't say it in a prayer or say it later, right. but right. it means that the manuscript didn't have a mention. And then right after that, not right after, but the next sermon I read was in November, the week after the 16th Street church mm -hmm. bombings, mm -hmm. where 
there was a week between that Sunday and the next Sunday, but there was, it was a sermon about Jonah and the whale, um, <laughs> and it didn't have any mention, and it really, and it was striking to all of us, you know, what words were said and what words were unsaid, um, what, you know, even racial slurs have been said in Duke Chapel, in quotes, or in, you know, uh, so it's been really interesting to note kind of the silences and the, right. and when they do speak, how they phrase it, you know, right. they didn't necessarily the delicacy. say it explicitly, they were like at the dime store, you know, they didn't right. say right. at the sit-in, so right. it's, been, it's been really interesting. Another question for one of the other teams? Yes. Um, I have a question for the Allen Building team. Um, and I was just wondering, like, how, how you're going to show the administration's response to the Allen Building takeover in your exhibit and, like, how you feel about the administration's response. Mm -hmm. I'll answer the first part of your question, and then I'll let somebody else. Um, the, we specifically focused on the day and the... Um, students during the day, but there was a few pieces that we decided to include that focused on how the administration was responding. Um, some of those included, um, they, um, the administration issued um, a 3.30 ultimatum to the students, um, urging them to leave the building by 4.30, um, and there was sort of a um, an unsaid threat that there would be a police confrontation if they did not leave. Um, later, um, after the students had actually left the building, the administration sort of retroactively issued another statement that was sort of the second ultimatum. Um, that was sort of how we chronicled their response to the takeover during the day. We also included a Chronicle article from that was published March 20th, 1969, that covered the um, trial where um, the administration um, hired some local Durham lawyers to ask, act as prosecutors in a university trial to, um, I guess, to try the students for violating the pickets and protest policy. They got probation, um, but that's sort of how the materials that we included. Um, so there was, when we went through the archives, there was a lot of information from the administration and not that much from the students. And so we knew that wanting to tell the story of the students, we would have to, to not, to, to not put aside the administration, but to go deeper into the students' stories. And so that took more research, more time in the archives, and we did eventually find student perspectives. There were very few, but we did find them. They did help us put together and piece the story because they were white students and black students, which helped us to gave, which gave us more sides of the story. The reason we didn't want to show the administration as much is we, we felt like their story was kind of known because they tell their story, and we wanted to tell the story of the students who haven't necessarily had the chance to voice theirs. How do you feel about partiality as a researcher? Like, how do you make peace with it? Or how do you strategize when you know you can't say everything or you know what you're going to say is going to be limited? Okay. Um, that was something that we really struggled with throughout the course of our project. We have a full tab of our final website that's researcher's, no researcher's note. And it's all the questions that we didn't have time to answer and all the reasons we didn't have time to answer those questions. Um, and that we, we you know, it's something that you really have to grapple with, and being aware of it is something, but it's not enough. And that's something that we have thought a lot about, thought about a lot in our project. Awesome. Yeah, thanks about it. We just we just admitted it. Like that yeah. was just as plain as that. Like, if we we have one tab, which was like most of the chapel story has been covered with the perspective of the um, the more administration and like. Um, and like that side of it, which we do have a tap, which we have one page on just for background. Um, and, but yeah, for the rest, like we just say, hey, this is, this is what it, the situation is. Um, and then that way, and we, that we tried our best to look past it and to get all as many sides as we could. And um, I hope, you know, hopefully we did the best job we could. Good afternoon. We are the Left of Black team. My name is Siandra Ellison. I'm a rising sophomore, double majoring in African American Studies and Psychology. And I'm Nicole Higgins. I'm a second year PhD student in the English department. 
And my name is Allison Raven. I am a second year PhD student in the history department. And we are missing our fourth team member today, who is rising senior Malcolm Brown. But we want to acknowledge him and shout him out for the invaluable work that he did this summer. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Okay, so today we're going to share with you our Left of Black Educational Enrichment Project that we did. Left of Black is a weekly uh, webcast that's produced by the John Hope Franklin Center at Duke and hosted by Dr. Mark Anthony Neal, who's here with us today. Uh, Dr. Neal interviews scholars and artists producing conversations on topics related to race. The Story Plus Left of Black project was created to utilize the shared knowledge over the existing eight seasons of Left of Black into topic-focused videos rather than scholar-focused videos for secondary classroom learning. Along with these videos, the goal was to create both lesson plans that could be utilized by teachers in these classrooms along with digital experiences that anyone could access individually to get more information about these topics. So um, as a part of this project, we created five topic-focused focus videos, along with digital experiences and lesson plans to correspond with each. And then we also created a website to house those videos and um, supplemental materials, um, which you can access now. The website went live today. Yay! Okay. <laughs> So in choosing our topics, we spent about a week watching videos from the archives and just looking for stories that could easily be pulled out um, that were missing from the history that we felt like people needed to know. And then we also just looked for places in the videos that sort of naturally seemed like um, good story snippets that we could pull out and translate for a class classroom experience. So what we're going to be sharing with you today is basically all of the materials that we created for one particular topic. Um, we started with a video interviewing Dr. Chad T. Williams about black veterans of World War I, and Cece went from there. All right. So I took on the task of shortening this 24-minute um, Left of Black episode into a three-minute clip, just basically focusing on the idea of military service and citizenship. This the scholarship that Dr. Williams presents in this Left of Black episode is something I never really encountered in a classroom. This idea of military service kind of like drove black veterans to fight in World War I because they felt that they would be more connected to like this American experience and this idea of patriotism being a fight for their country. And this was actually my first time video editing for this project and this was my second video that I created and here's a snippet of that. Civil War is really important because this was really the formative period in thinking about certainly the black military experience, right. the role of African Americans in the Union Army, close to 200,000, serving exploits of the Massachusetts 54th, but also how that leads into the direct formation of a type of African American citizenship. So we see African Americans like W.B. Du Bois, other black leaders who are very explicitly hearkening back to the Civil War and Reconstruction era and thinking about World War I as the next step in this journey, this quest for African American citizenship and how military service, how These heroic exploits on the battlefield, shedding blood, engaging in this kind of ultimate sacrifice as citizens is going to be the key, the linchpin for African Americans staking claim to their citizenship. So along with each video that we created, we created a corresponding digital experience. With these digital experiences, Dr. Neal's vision was to have something that would expand upon the information available in these videos um, that could be accessed solo by anyone looking for a more immersive experience. So the digital experiences we created include multiple timelines, a story map, and a playlist. Um, so basically, after Siandra finished this video, um, we had a conversation about um, what kind of experience would make sense. And we thought in this case, um, a timeline that sort of highlighted key pieces of legislation um, that would make, help make the connection for folks sitting in a classroom who are perhaps not black and wondering, like, that's great, but how does this you know, matter to me? And so um, I created this timeline. Um, one of the great things about this tool was that I was able, in a lot of cases, to also embed like, additional video content for more context. Um, so for instance, um, one of the pieces of legislation I highlighted was um, one that um, basically ended the Mexican-American War and allowed residents to choose whether they wanted to be Mexican or American citizens. 
Um, and then if you'll scroll over to uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act, right, this is the first piece of legislation that um, targets a specific ethnic group. And we see definitely um, those reverberations still today. Um, a key part of this project from the beginning was to make black studies accessible to secondary classrooms. So a really important part of a project for us was creating lesson plans. Our project leads, Camille and Catherine, sent out a survey to teachers at the beginning of the project asking what they most needed for their classrooms. And the survey responses indicated a particular need for lessons relating to black history and English. And so we focused in on that while creating these lesson plans. And so I also took on the task of creating a lesson plan for this video. And this was my first time creating a lesson plan, and it was not easy <laughs> by any means. Shout out to all the educators in the room. This is not, oh, y'all, amazing. <laughs> so luckily for this, I was not alone in the lesson plan. Allison and Nicole actually have prior edu experience in education, and so this lesson plan was a collaborative effort. And we created something that had cross-cultural connections just outside of black studies. So when you go on the website to the lesson plan, there is a link to the worksheet that goes along with it. And so for this worksheet, we have students defining what citizenship means to them. And we have the rights and responsibilities of citizenship listed for them. And as I go through the World War I video, we have questions that correspond to it in terms of thinking about military service and citizenship. And then we transition over to Japanese soldiers in World War II. And this is kind of like this kind of pivotal moment which you have Japanese soldiers in internment camps and then you have others fighting for um, the military in America. And then we have a present day connection to Mexican immigrants today who are actually very vital within the military service. And we're kind of seeing how this idea of military service and citizenship kind of connects here. And one of the questions that we ask students before the worksheet is, since military service is a responsibility of citizenships, can non-citizens or should non-citizens be able to participate in the military? And also, if non-citizens participate in the military, should they receive citizenship for this service? And so we, at, we pose this question at the beginning of the worksheet, and students go through the activity, and towards the end, we want to see if these kind of perceptions and these ideas change over time through completing this activity. And so when you go back to the worksheet, we have procedures for the teachers to like follow in terms of like teaching the lesson plan, as well as common core standards to see how they relate to the overall education field. And this is for every single lesson plan that we put onto the website. Yeah, so that is just a real quick overview, a sneak peek of the work that we've done this summer. We're really proud of um, all of the work we've completed, and we want to just leave you with a few of um, the takeaways that we are walking away from this experience with. Yeah, this is my first experience in like a professional setting, doing research and working with a team. This is like an actual collaborative team, communicating effectively, getting things done, dividing up the work equally among everybody, and kind of seeing how like our ideas unfold and how the project took a turn. And I also got to go valuable skills in like lesson planning, video editing, and working with these digital tools, which can like further my research in the future. And I really enjoyed getting to work on a team again, that that's not something that you always get to do in the academy, and so that was a really great experience. For me, I also really um, loved getting to kind of meld my world that I came to Duke having been a middle school teacher and then now working in academia. This was a great way to meld things that are really important to me. Yeah, and I agree with Allison. Uh, for me, this project was just a wonderful opportunity to emerge from the silos of academia and just be in conversation with teammates um, who are passionate about black studies, um, thinking about how to make black studies uh, more legible and public facing, right? Because this is American culture and it's really important. So right now, two lesson plans and digital experiences are live on the website, and three more should be going up by the end of the summer. You can visit the website now. The website is live, and the videos are up on the Franklin Center's YouTube channel. It's um, sites.duke.edu slash leftofblackenrichment. So please feel free to go check it out for more information. Yes. Um, I just want to introduce these guys real quickly. Um, we are the HIV AIDS Illustrated Memoir Team. Um, I'm Max Maleski. I am a PhD student in the Computational Media Arts and Cultures program here at Duke. Um, and for our project, um, we were working with a rather unique archive collected by one individual through their career in um, HIV AIDS research and activism, working for N NGOs um, in the UN globally. Um, and from this, 
Ashley, Brock, and Christina made a zine um, directly working from content in the archive. Um, I'm really proud of what they produced. I think it's super awesome and way beyond anything I could ever imagine. And so uh, without further ado, here they are. So I'm Brock. My name is Ashley Manico. I'm Christina. Thank you. Uh, and if we can get that first slide. Factual truths are never compellingly true. The historian knows how vulnerable is the whole texture of facts in which we spend our daily life. Facts need testimony to be remembered and trustworthy domain of human affairs. So our project was centered on the Maria de Brun papers over in the Rubenstein Library on West Campus. This archive is a collection of scholarly works as well as posters, pamphlets, and other ephemera, um, all related to women's rights and global health in the context of HIV and AIDS. Our goal was to distill narrative from this collection to translate factual truths into testimony. Uh, we've incorporated a lot of facts, data points, and things that are or were plain truth. And if we've done a good job, then our readers will find those facts stitched together into stories about people, uh, testimonies to illustrate what has happened, what is still happening, and why we should care. So in our first week in the archive, I found a document that intrigued me so much, it became the focus of my section of the project. Um, it's called the Handbook for Legislators on HIV, AIDS, Law, and Human Rights. There's a lot of juicy stuff in there if you're a public policy nerd. Uh, but the thing that struck me most was a list of rights excerpted from the UDHR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, that was applied specifically to people living with HIV and AIDS. That list became the structural backbone of my pages as I centered each set of panels on a particular right that I saw documented in the archive, mostly violations of them, but occasionally cases where people's rights were being protected. So this first page, centered on the right to privacy, gives a good example of the sources that I pulled from to illustrate my point. I used testimonies from court cases and collections by various NGOs to share intensely personal stories, such as the one in the top row there. Uh, I also saw certain rights emphatically defended in pamphlet after pamphlet, so I extrapolated that the people writing pamphlets saw violations of those rights, and the panels on the left are a good example of this. Then for the second page, I don't actually have anything specific to point out here. I just picked this page because I thought it turned out really well, and I wanted you all to appreciate it with me. <laughs> um, but it shows off nicely the overall effect I'm going for, this sense of a flurry of complex issues all tangled around a central topic. The right is at the center of the page, structural and stable, but what draws your eye is the pictures, the people, these glimpses into struggles you may not have even heard of, but that have affected and continue to affect people all over the world. I'll turn it over to my colleague, Ashley. Thank you. While looking through the archives, I was particularly interested in material that was centered around women's rights and empowerment. This combined with the films that we watched, articles that I came across, and information we received from two different interviews, I, it made me aware that there are still discrepancies that women face through this epidemic and how they are still currently left disadvantaged. And within my pages, I would like to focus on the intersectionality of HIV and particularly how that relates to gender inequality. And for this first page I have up here, this is focusing on biologically how the HIV virus affects female and male bodies differently and how that is important because with this, that the rate of HIV among young girls and women is more than double that of similarly aged males. However, they are still less represented in research trials and biologically things like Immunity genes in the X chromosome and modulations in hormones can affect different medications. And if they're not being properly tested, you can't effectively treat this group. And to make it more wide scaled, on a global scale, I'm discussing how, on these two pages, how gender inequality and cultural practices can leave women disadvantaged in more severe instances such as domestic violence and coercive sterilization 
and how that shows that if on large scales that they are facing these difficulties, how can they better govern their bodies and protect themselves from infections and things of that sort. And lastly, a third page that I have to show with you guys is how the virus impacts women and their sexuality and how it affects how they continue in their relationships and also how they look at their own bodies internally. And now I'm going to pass this off to Christina. Hi, I just want to take this moment to highlight the breadth and depth of the archive that we got to really research and delve into. Um, we all read through the materials in it, and yet we came with three different topics and very three different graphic styles. I just want to mention that these are only a few of the pages that they've made. Um, they've made 10 to 12 pages. Um, we've all did each. And so when I read through the archive, I really wanted to highlight the thoughts, questions, and concerns of women living with HIV AIDS. And I particularly emphasized on the intersectionality. So what does it mean to be a woman and having HIV AIDS? Um, but there's also different interconnected social categorizations like motherhood or your profession. And how have these mindsets changed over time given the advent of medication and prevention? So what did I make? Well, this is my first and second page, and my frame narrative is entitled Some Thoughts at Night. And I wanted to really highlight the stories and the testimonies and the facts that I got to read. And I chose an ambiguous narrator who is literally having some thoughts at night on what it means on being a woman and having HIV AIDS in the present day, um, what was forgotten, and a retrospective look and thoughts. Um, as you see on the right-hand side, that's my second page, and I included the title medication. Um, and in the blue boxes are the thoughts that, that she asked, but it's interspersed with facts. Um, you can see in the white text, such as medication studies in the United States during the 1990s would keep women from participating with phrases such as no pregnant woman and no non-pregnant woman. And things like that to really highlight um, why women have these thoughts. Um, what were the legislation and the context of the social um, in the 80s and 90s? So how did I make this? Well, it was a lot of changing directions. I initially tackled my chapter with making a timeline. Um, as you can see there, it was a lot of writing, a lot of text. It was really text heavy, and I thought that I was losing the really personal narratives and the testimonies that I got to see in the archives. So I switched into questions, um, as you can see, and making it more images to see what they would have been seeing during while they were living through it. And so why did I make this? Why, why? Um, <laughs> something really special that we got to do is that while we were researching through the archive, um, we got to have Maria talk to us and she also introduced us to Marion and Hannah. Marion, who lives in South Africa, and Hannah from the Netherlands. And we got to interview them through Skype. And Hannah was really wonderful and mentioned something that really stuck with me, and was that a problem that a lot of people living with HIV AIDS is that self-stigma can be so crippling. And I wanted, and I kept on thinking about it and reflecting on it, and that made me want to turn that back to the reader. Um, how can they reflect? How can they think? So my final page is some questions that keep me up at night. And I ask the reader to not only think about it, but to write, um, put themselves into the narrative that I've created, and hopefully take away from it. So thank you to my colleagues, who have been so collaboratively wonderful. Thank you to Max, our grad mentor. And thank you to Maria for giving us a great archive. And really, I hope that y'all will look into it because there's some really great gems in there and stories that have been lost. So thank you. Um, so we're the Women in Labor team. Um, and we've been working with the Sally Bingham Center for Women's History and Culture. Um, to create um, an exhibit about women in labor movements. I'm Gia Cummings, I'm a rising sophomore. Um, and we also have been working on our team with Sadia Ayez, Claire Payton, newly defended PhD. Um, 
Um, and our archivists, Kelly Wooten and Laura Mickham, um, who've been great helping us with this project. Um, and we're really excited to have this opportunity because we feel like humanities research skills are like opportunities for that are hard to come by at Duke. So we're really grateful for Story Plus for giving us that opportunity. Yeah, so specifically we worked a lot with the Baskin Collection, which is based on the idea that um, women, particularly working women and women of color, have always been in the workplace, and that um, this idea that only currently have women been in the workplace um, is a very, um, is kind of um, assumes that white middle class women has been the central experience. So um, Lisa Baskin, who's the collector for this collection, collected a variety of materials um, that span from printers in the 16th century to um, letters by Emma Goldman, an anarchist. And by bringing attention to both women and workers, these two groups that have been historically marginalized, um, this collection asserts the importance of the history of these groups and kind of frames them as um, active agents rather than passive non-agents in history um, and they've in reality been asserting a lot of control over labor conditions for centuries. Um, so our final product that we created was a website that we used building Omeka, built using Omeka and some basic coding um, which will serve as an online research guide to display the wealth of material that the Rubenstein Library has to offer in regards to women and labor movements. Um, so we've made a few collection highlights including the Barbara Bergman papers, um, Therese El Amin papers, um, papers on the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, and some other ones where you can click on them, find um, a summary that we've created, and some objects from the archive that we've highlighted for researchers to come and see what we have to offer pr like prior to attending the archive. Um, and in addition to that, to delve further into the archive and to expand on it, we each created our own individual exhibits dealing with a topic that we found interesting. Yeah, and in building these exhibits, um, we learned we learned to practice a lot of humanities re research methods. Um, and what we found particularly interesting was that, um, unlike maybe a classroom setting or a science lab, we didn't come in with a very preconceived idea of what we wanted to achieve. Um, we kind of interacted with the materials in a more dynamic way. Um, it was very primary source driven, and we have to figure out for ourselves why these materials are important. Um, um, and how to present them to the audience. And in doing so, we really found that like interacting with primary resources comes with choosing an object that other people might not seem find relevant, and collecting is that same way, collecting and saving objects that people might not find relevant, and creating a narrative out of them, and pulling their significance and relevance into like a context of a larger story. So that's what we wanted to do with our exhibit. So I'm going to first talk a little bit about my exhibit, uh, which is on prostitution and labor organizing. So I personally found that um, a lot of debates around prostitution and sex work um, are characterized by a lot of heated ideological or theoretical debates on both sides, or like arguments on both sides, but not a lot of um, voices of the actual women um, in the work. Um, so for example, last year in uh, a class, I wrote a paper on the policy implications of different criminalization and decriminalization models, but I found that the research um, results by scholars are very limited by the lack of data or testimony by real women. So I was really excited to encounter um, a lot of materials in the Rubenstein and the Baskin Collection um, representing the voices of these people themselves. Um, in my exhibit, I, I extensively used the newspaper issues of Coyote, which is um, arguably the first prostitutes rights organization in the US, um, to directly look into what they were saying and what they wanted and kind of reframe them as active agents in history uh, who made an impact on society in their own ways. And I found that they were by no means a very monolithic group. They had very diverse experiences and identities and opinions. Um, and in a way, uh, by doing this, I'm bringing to the forefront voices that have been oppressed by both um, the creators of this mainstream historical narrative and the idea that sexuality is not something to be spoken of, especially by women. And in general, I just thought it was a cool topic because um, of its kind of unique place in feminist labor history, the fact that uh, the profession is illegal right, currently in the US, um, and that being one of the main obstacles to union, unionization, um, and 
the extensive use of body, uh, a woman's body in the work, um, the tensions in the feminist community about this topic, these things all made it a very um, unique theme for me to explore. Um, so specifically, my exhibit is divided into several different sections. Um, the first one is on women in the suffrage movement and prostitution, where I pulled um, newspaper articles from the revolution the Revolution, um, which was a newspaper by Elizabeth Stanton and Susan Anthony. Um, and the second section was on 20th century discourses where I looked into um, what scholars, especially in early, early 20th century Chicago were talking about um, related to prostitution. Uh, and for that, I pulled out a lot of books from the Baskin Collection and the remaining um, Two, three sections are on Coyote, its background, its advocacy and lobbying activities as an organization, um, and the last section kind of gives an overview of what other uh, prostitutes, unions, associations, um, and organizations across the nation were doing in the 1970s, um, as reported by the Coyote newspapers. So my exhibit is about um, maternity in the workplace. Um, so it's titled The Working Mom. And um, looking around in like contemporary newspapers and things, I found that pregnancy and being a mom is still like a huge deterrent to women in the workplace. Um, even though w women, mothers have been working for centuries, for as long as there's been jobs, mothers have been in those jobs. Um, so I really wanted to pull back and through my research, I found like how that discrimination has played out over time. Um, so my first, Part of my exhibit is a timeline that um, highlights different legislation, um, executive orders, and different things that affected women's ability to control their own re reproductivity in the workplace. Um, and it kind of shows that how it's progressed over time. But I just want to make sure that like, I highlight that progression is not a linear thing, and it's not something that builds upon itself, and it still can progress and can things that we have that we take for granted um, can still be rolled back and it does, nothing is permanent. Um, so my second exhibit is called Mothering While Enslaved. Um, and I really was, um, like this exhibit was really important to me because slavery really took complete autonomy from the body and it took complete autonomy from mothers, their ability to, to parent and to interact with their children. Um, so this exhibit highlights the slave experience in motherhood um, that's a letter from a slave mother. Um, she's looking for her child. She doesn't know where she is. Um, she has no idea. And then this um, second exhibit, I mean the second letter, is, a, is from a doctor who um, examines a slave patient, notices that she has a prolapsed uterus, so her uterus is completely out of her body, and he's like, well, if I can put this machine on her, we can send her back out into the fields. So just thinking about how she had like a complete lack of control over her own body. Um, and my third part of my exhibit is about women organizing for themselves. So all of these publications were created for, for and by women um, and tracking their views on maternity and how they wanted to approach that um, when they're organizing for themselves um, unions and like um, national women's conferences and even a zine that highlights um, some of the views on welfare and motherhood. Um, so that's my exhibit about pregnancy in the workplace. Um, and so we really wanted to highlight that because Story Plus is a humanities research project, we wanted to think about what the humanities means to us. And we've landed on the fact that the humanities is a way to, to ask questions and then to have those answers. Um, and we learned how to build a website and do archival research, but all that is in a larger project of identifying how social power dynamics work. And the humanities are so important for understanding who has power and who has power controls, who tells what stories. And so these stories that we've highlighted are not part of a larger narrative that you would find in a textbook because the people in power don't want those stories in a textbook. But the humanities allows us to, to highlight those stories and to tell stories that may not be um, ones that are perpetuated by those people in power. And um, we thought that our work is particularly important, not um, not only because of shifting these power dynamics, but also um, because these uh, social issues that we're looking into are so relevant today. And I know that um, just yesterday, um, the su Supreme Court ruled um, a California law unconstitutional, which required pregnancy clinics to uh, tell women about abortion options. So that was unconstitutional. Uh, that was constant. Wait. 
That was constitutional. No, unconstitutional. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and sex workers are still fighting a lot of injustices, um, fighting for better work conditions and um, to be respected as members of the economy. So we really think that activism and policy really requires, require the humanities. Um, and in order to fight these injustices, we need to know how they operate and um, projects like this really allow us to do that and answer those questions. Excellent. Do we have questions for our three teams? Yes. Uh, I, in last semester, I read this book called Sex Workers, Psychics, and Number Runners, um, Black Women in New York City. And it talked about like the underground society and how people um, made a living through the underground. Um, because they couldn't get regular jobs, um, even with degrees. And so when you talk about prostitution, how were they able to capture these stories? Were they primarily outside the United States? Or were there people that documented, but you just had to dig to find out about prostitution and how it works in the underground society? Um, so. I actually mainly used um, the newspapers of Coyote, the, the prostitutes' rights organization, and I was really surprised by the extent to which they like organized activities and lobbied, called their Congress representatives, um, um, did a lot of advocacy work. Um, yeah, I, I'm definitely aware that it, um, the, it, it's very hard to find materials on the ground, and that's what kind of made it even more exciting to, like, to like know that there's this organization that exists and um, to be able to look at their materials and all the achievements that they've had. It was in the States in the 1970s, yeah. Another question? Hi, this is also for the Women in Labor team. Um, I was wondering if you guys, uh, since you primarily worked with the Coyote Archive, um, if you guys got to learn anything about the intersection between citizen status, like a lot of migrant women came into the United States and they were taken advantage of for their sexual labor as a form of getting into the United States. I was wondering if you learned anything about that and how much of your um, archival knowledge translated to closer to modern day. Um, in terms of more of an intersectionality perspective. I feel like I didn't really get that much from the Coyote newspapers. I don't know if, if I don't know if it's because they were mainly run by white women, um, but sometimes they did make the distinction between sex trafficking and prostitution because it seems like not ev not every um, scholar or not everybody was making that distinction. Um, but yeah, I really thought that. Um, kind of perspectives from a more diverse group of women would be helpful. Do we have a question for the left of black team or the HIV team? Uh, I have a question for the HIV um, memoir team. Yeah, I was just wondering of what kind of prior graphic experience, art experience you had coming in, because those looked really amazing. Well, I don't have any, I don't draw, so this was just sort of, um, these, these two have the artistic experience. Did so. you draw yours? Yes, I did draw mine by hand. Uh, thank you. <laughs> draw, and, then I, and then I did lettering in Photoshop, but. <laughs> well, I have some art experience from high school. I've taken a couple of studio art classes, taken some art classes here, and took a comic book class here, so. I feel like those kind of helped with this final project. I have no practical art skills. Um, I'm a prospective art history student, so I've studied art, but <laughs> um, that doesn't mean I can draw. And funny enough, Brock ended up being the only one of us to draw, actually. The rest of us, um, I'm now proficient, I'd like to say, in Photoshop <laughs> and Illustrator, so vector drawings on the computer. <laughs> Um, so I have a question for Left of Black. Um, I was wondering, it's like, as students, usually when we are creating things in the class, like 
during the school year, you're creating it for your professor or for other students, like an academic audience. How did you think about um, creating like the videos and the educational materials for like a younger audience and how did that affect your process? Um, well, for me, I was the only one that's like, cause like, okay, sorry. So I'm like the youngest person on the team. So I kind of have that connection to like being back in high school cause that's where I was last year. Um, so <laughs> I kind of, yeah, I basically just use my own like experience in high school and like what I kind of like would have wanted to learn myself and what I felt was missing from my own education to apply it for high school learning. This is for Cece, hi. <laughs> um, I guess as someone who is went to the North Carolina public schools all her life, and as someone who is from, and I'm referring to you, as someone who is from Greensboro, which is like this, one of the civil rights capitals of the United States, I was wondering if there's anything that you learned here that you didn't already know from being in a center like that. And what is something you hope people who are still in maybe your old high school would learn from this too? Honestly, I think, I had some connections to a lot of the material that we were discussing. Like we looked at stuff about colorism, representation, and those things were things I have explored on my own, but each video offered a new perspective that I myself have not considered. And so I think each video has a, something that can like further your own education, even if you come in with prior knowledge. So I don't know, just have to go to the website and look at the stuff. <laughs> like, I gotta go check it out. <laughs> Okay, so on that note, this has just been, you know, an amazing uh, uh, event. I've just been so impressed with like all the presentations and, and also the, the fact that you are only presenting this tiny snapshot of all the, of, of this amazing painstaking work that you did in these six weeks and I've, I'm just floored. Um, but and now I want to actually turn the mic over to um, Ed Ballison, our Vice Provost for Inter... Just, I always skip, I always trip over this. Vice Provost for Interdisciplinary Studies. Okay, Ed. So first let me just echo Chris's thanks earlier uh, at the beginning of this incredible afternoon, uh, just to thank everyone who's been involved in this program over the last uh, six weeks and before that, because there was a tremendous amount of planning that went into it as well. Uh, Ranji Khanna, the head of, of FHI. Uh, of course, Chris, Jules, and Amanda, uh, the, the Story Plus Central team. Uh, Maria Wisdom, all the graduate student mentors, uh, FI, FHI staff, all the people from the library and from sponsoring organizations, uh, and the faculty sponsors in many cases who provided guidance. This is very much a team effort. Um, I, I think that we do best at Duke when we find a way to uh, facilitate the capacity of students and faculty and staff to pose really important questions that don't yet have answers, uh, to, to pursue those questions with really innovative modes of, of inquiry, uh, and to think creatively about how to communicate whatever the findings are that come out of that research. And the symposium today, I, I would say, is just a stunning example of that Duke in action. It's just been fantastic to hear, uh, again, just the, the little slices uh, of work that you've all done over the course uh, of the last six weeks. I, I wanna note just how broad the topics were, uh, just some dimensions of that. Uh, many, a couple of the topics are just right here at Duke in a very profound way. Others are about the region, the, lo the local setting, uh, either the city setting or, or the regional setting. Few of the topics are, are either international or actually global in their scope, uh, and that's, that's very uh, much in line with what humanists look at, um, those different scales of, of analysis. Uh, the, the, the projects also speak to the vitality of, of humanistic research and thinking uh, with many, many different types of research strategy uh, and uh, the full panoply now of ways of communicating uh, narrative kinds of interpretations uh, from research findings to audiences. Text, sound, image, that's still image, that's moving and mixing and matching of all of those. Uh, I, I hope that all of the individuals involved, the students and graduates, the undergraduates and graduate students alike, uh, will, will take some time, maybe not this evening, but in the, in the days and weeks to come, 
to reflect a bit on the nature of the learning experience that you've all gone through. And we heard a lot about that in many of the presentations, which I found really, really compelling. Thinking about what, what you've learned about open-ended research, uh, about how to construct narrative, that's not an easy uh, endeavor, I think, as you've all learned and many of you talked about quite explicitly, about the, um, the benefits and sometimes the challenges, although we didn't hear too much about that, of teamwork of actually figuring out who's going to do what and, and, uh, and, and understanding uh, that there's comparative advantage sometimes, that people have specific skill sets, uh, although sometimes you might surprise yourself about what turns out to be something you're good at. Um, and I think it's, it's worth, uh, by the same token, reflecting as some of you clearly have already done about um, what resonates with you, where, you, you, where your passions really lie uh, and how that might have some uh, pointers or implications for what you might want to do next. Uh, there's a really strong power, I think, in reflection after this type of an intense experience, and I would really encourage everyone to do some of it, whether that's just thinking or maybe writing or talking with other people about, about the experience. And, and then um, finally, just a few thoughts to put some kernel of ideas in maybe some of your minds about possible next steps. Uh, for some of you, that might be literally thinking about how you might take the research you've done one step further, maybe an independent study, maybe a senior project of some kind, a senior thesis. Um, but also, for those of you, and many of you said quite uh, eloquently, uh, made this point, for those of you who found teamwork really a compelling uh, approach to, to research and education and outreach and how to link them all together, uh, just be aware that there are a lot of opportunities at Duke out there for you. Uh, there are humanities labs, both based here at the Franklin Humanities Institute and also now increasingly anchored in departments. The English department has a humanities lab. Art, art history and visual studies has several labs. There's one, looks like it's going to be coming to the history department next year. Another probably coming to Ames. And that process is going to continue over the next several years. There are Bass Connections teams. Uh, one, of, one of the Story Plus teams will have, as you know, a Bass Connections team over the course of the year, but there are others. And we're going to be doing a, a late intake this fall, uh, right in August, for people who might even want to think about doing a year-long team this year. Uh, for grad students, I wanted just to mention a couple of other opportunities aside from Bass Connections teams or the Humanities Labs. Uh, there is this thing you can apply for, a Bass Instructional Fellowship. And one of the things we're going to be trying to do this year, you'll be hearing from us, is to encourage people to think about proposing for that instructional fellowship some type of Bass Connections-like or Story Plus-like experience, embedding team-based inquiry into a course, whether one that already exists or perhaps a new one that aligns specifically with your, your interests. So I just want to thank everyone for all the hard work over the last uh, month and a half and even before that, and just to applaud all of you, the students in particular, for such a spectacular job of present presenting your work over that time. Now before we dessert, we have some prizes to give. So as, as many of you know, at the beginning of Story Plus, we created an Instagram account as another type of platform where the students could play out a public type of storytelling. It was an experiment, and it was amazing. We, we introduced it to them as a sort of challenge, because that's what I like to do with my students, challenge them to do things, because then they tend to ramp up the enthusiasm. And so now um, we have a winner. Chosen by popular vote, and I'll get, I have my numbers again. So we had nine teams, five weeks of takeover. Two teams took over the Instagram each week. We gave them full access, password, and everything. We had 113 posts and nearly as many comments. We went from zero to 121 followers in five weeks, really in four, because we had that many last week, which is amazing. <laughs> Right? I think Aaron could probably attest to that. We had dozens of uh, Insta stories, a whole slew of emojis, and dancing digital stickers. So we had 35 votes, and the winner is, yeah, how do we do a drum roll? <laughs> Left of Black.
We have prizes for them. We, we, we do not have prizes, but you can take away a bit of pride for the second and third place teams. Uh, coming in second was preaching and protest. And coming in. Woo! Coming in third was Coal in America. And that's it. So, I believe there's pie to celebrate us.